Yeah. 
Dzień dobry Państwu. Good morning everybody. Zapraszam na drugi dzień konferencji Kresy Syberia. Pamięć pokoleń 2018. 
Jeszcze się wszyscy schodzą. I na początek, zgodnie z programem, zapraszam pana dyrektora Muzeum Pamięci Sybiru z Białego Stoku. Proszę bardzo. Dzień dobry, witam państwa bardzo serdecznie. Good morning. I think that uh, will be better when I uh, speak English. I would like to say thank you that we can present our new museum, the Siberia Memorial Museum. To the most important words, Kresy and Siberia are very important for us too. Our museum commemorates the history of the former Eastern territory of the Second Polish Republic and memory of Siberian trauma. We show peaceful life before the Second World War, the beginning of the war, or to our enemies, first Nazis and next the Soviet Union. But the most important part of our story is living in Siberia during the Stalin time. We also talk about Anders' army and memory of Siberia trauma after the Second World War in communist Poland and abroad in the West country. I know that we are going to cooperate with Kresy Siberia Foundation. Together, we should create our memory about the past, about our Polish history. Why are we building our museum in Białystok? During four large-scale deportations organized in the 1940s, about tens of thousands of inhabitants of uh, Białystok and its surrounding were deported to Siberia and Kazakhstan. Particularly, every fifth inhabitant of Białystok disappeared from his or her apartment, house, courtyard, street, or square. Now Białystok is the last huge city in Poland, which before the Second World War was located in the eastern part of the Second Polish Republic. Now it's also a kind of window to the east. When we are building our main exhibition, for us the most important words are memory, truth, and survive. In the Polish, it's free P. Pamięć, prawda, przetrwanie. So now uh, we would like to show the project of our museum. We have the presentation of, uh, about uh, the idea of our museum, Siberia Memorial Museum. Pan Piotr, I think that I uh, show you uh, our presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the uh, floor. Uh, let me be a bit more mobile, okay? Won't you mind? And I will use some laser indicators as well. Uh, so, starting our presentations, uh, our presentation, we see we can see the building, the concept of the building of the new museum. As you can see, it uh, it is quite modern, but this is only one part of it, showing the elevation from the side that will be added to the uh, original building. And in my presentation, I will show you uh, the both sides, the new one as well as the uh, original building, and also speak uh, some words about the concept, the idea as. Uh, uh, our director, uh, Mr. Szyszyński, uh, previously said. So, uh, to move on. Uh, 
Uh, our presentation will be uh, divided in three main parts. The first one will be an, about the idea, the second about the activities of the museum, and the third one will uh, describe the main exhibition. And the idea of uh, our museum focuses on, on three topics. Uh, first of all, its background starts from uh, the lack of an institution covering comprehensively the whole topic of Siberian deportations, not only the, the topic of deportations in World War II, which is the most known, uh, but also uh, starting from 17th century. So we put our uh, starting point in the times of first Polish Republic, actually. Uh, the second thing is the necessity of uh, conserving the heritage and memory, because uh, it's hard to believe, but there is no such uh, institution in Poland and in the world which covers this sole topic, okay? Some of the foundations, like Kresy Siberia Foundation, uh, they have, of course, great impact, uh, and they are responsible for uh, keeping the, the heritage and commemoration. But our museum will be a kind of a meeting point for such foundations and institutions, and it will be a kind of a central place for such meetings and uh, making a kind of a new energy uh, coherence. Okay, so the third thing is a kind of a social, social need. Uh, currently, the Siberian deportees uh, create their own places of, of commemora commemorance and rem remembrance. We have uh, such places in Białystok, in a variety of, of cities and places in Poland, and there are also others spread around the world. So, as I mentioned previously, we want to uh, organize this in a one kind of coherent and uh, with a good impact uh, museum. So, uh, this is the background and our mission. Uh, our main goal is uh, to collect, to protect, and to share every single item of knowledge about the topic of deportations. So, it's not only about the great history, it's also about those little items that are close to your hearts, to the heart of every Siberian deportee, which is for the society often not even known because people don't see those items. They are in uh, the houses or in the family heirlooms of, of the Siberian deportees and their uh, descendants. And the goal of our museum is to collect it or its copies and to present it to the public to prevent these items and their backstories from being forgotten. So this is our main goal. Also, we focus on the topic of Eastern borderlands, Kresy Wschodnie, which are now uh, mostly, as uh, Director Szleszyński said, behind our Eastern border. Białystok is the only place left. So we do not forget about that topic as well. Uh, and here you can see our uh, actual current um, main exhibition. I will also say about this uh, in a moment. Uh, the question, why Białystok for such a place? Uh, I had the pleasure in the previous evening to speak to some of you and uh, also gave some answers to this question, uh, which is a very important one. Uh, as Mr. Szczeszynski said, uh, this is the last big city left in uh, Poland that was taken by the Soviets in 1939. Uh, each of every five citizens uh, disappeared uh, deported to the east, uh, but also currently Białystok is the one of the biggest uh, places uh, where uh, Siberian deportees, their families, their descendants live. So this society is strong, and since 17, actually now 18 years, uh, this, the city hosts the annual march uh, that commemorates the Siberian deportees, uh, the biggest event, I guess, in the world that commemorates the fate of, of Siberian uh, deportations. Okay, so now moving to the action, because I ended the previous part with an action, actually, uh, the march. Uh, but uh, the museum's activities are wider than the march itself. We are organizing the main exhibition and the temporary ones. Uh, in a moment, I will, of course, uh, expand this topic. Uh, we are collecting and conserving exhibits, which is really, really important, and it's uh, linked to our main goal, to conserve the memory. Uh, we also uh, provide ac educational activities to the students, but also to uh, various groups, not only pupils, but also older um, younglings, uh, like students, and also for uh, people, uh, for adults. Uh, organizing artistic events, like concerts, like movie projections, so it's a wide, wide topic. Uh, scientific conferences and research seminars, uh, we participate in such, like right now, and we also organize them in Białystok. 
uh, for uh, making the society of people who work on this topic closer. Okay, so this is an uh, important uh, impact on the scientific work uh, covering the topic of, of deportations. Uh, publishing activity, uh, and I have something that will prove that uh, in my bag, so after our presentation uh, you will be able to take some leaflets, handouts, and publications of, of the museum. Um, uh, popularization of the remembrance, so this is a kind of a quite obvious um, goal and activity. Uh, we do it in various ways, uh, using social media, using traditional media, uh, organizing those, uh, all those um, activities uh, upwards and the last part of our activity is uh, organizing help with searching for data uh, about the deportees for their families for their descendants so if somebody searches for his uh, or her parents or grandparents their fate where they were deported how to find that place because often the name of the gulag or the name of the camp or a, a village is no longer meaning anything in soviet russia for example they had a certain name now this name changed and it's hard to find them so we organize help how to find it and uh, it's also a very important part of our activity uh, the Siberian Memorial Museum was founded on 2nd of January 2017, so we're quite a young institution, but uh, still we managed to achieve some, uh, some uh, successes, and I will present them just in a moment. Oh, by the way, here we have some first sneak peeks on the uh, model of the new uh, seat of the museum. Also, you can see the older building I've mentioned in the beginning of my presentation. This is the new one the metal and glass and concrete, and this is the old one. I will also uh, say something about it, this in a moment. Uh, while waiting for the construction, we now have the temporary exhibition center, and it uh, hosts uh, the variety of activities I've mentioned um, a moment ago. You can see that it covers both the adults, uh, the Siberian deputies and their families, and also children uh, from schools, from kindergartens, so uh, the activity is uh, addressed to virtually all citizens of Białystok and also uh, everybody who wants to come to visit our museum. Uh, also, we are uh, active outside of our walls, presenting some uh, temporary exhibitions, open-air exhibitions. You can uh, have a glimpse of what do I mean. It's uh, a set of our exhibitions in the open air, in some tunnels, undergrounds, also, uh, we use some um, specific forms, not only uh, boards like here, but also some pavilions and uh, silhouettes of people. Here is a kind of a, a, s a special exhibition. Uh, it looks like people are standing next to people, and this is a silhouette only. So this was uh, this uh, had really great interest with with the visitors uh, of Bewistok. <clears throat> and the last part of our activity. Uh, I want to say something more about it. It's the march uh, I've mentioned previously. Uh, the museum participates in the organization of each march uh, since we are uh, active, so since uh, over uh, one and a half a year. Uh, this year, in 2018, the march was organized under the um, theme of Via Siberia to Independent Poland, and we also prepared two exhibitions that uh, were presented at the march venue at the beginning and at the uh, end. And uh, now, uh, I would like to say something about the, um, let's say, more um, gentle activity of our museum, more subtle. Uh, it's, uh, I named it Care and Commemoration. It's not uh, so organized in like events or uh, certain uh, meetings of people. It's more diverse. Uh, we uh, try to uh, meet with uh, the deportees. We try to organize some meetings with uh, their descendants. Like here, uh, this lady's uh, parents uh, made some uh, memories. Uh, a book was uh, published by our museum. So we organized uh, some meetings for, for, uh, school, uh, for school children with them. Uh, after that meetings, the pupils could talk with, with, the, uh, with the lady. Also, we uh, uh, meet uh, Siberian deportees and their families in our museum collect uh, materials from them, uh, conserve them, and this is a really important uh, branch and part of our activity. Uh, this is the care, not only for the documents, but also for the people. They often need, uh, they often need uh, to speak, speak about their experiences, to present what did they uh, came through, or their parents came through, or grandparents, and uh, we do not only 
collect the documents, but also listen to them, write down those memories or uh, record them, which will be also presented in a moment. As you can see, we have a glimpse of what uh, people uh, share with us. Uh, some big boxes, some small boxes, some really small items like, uh, like this, um, or uh, little booklets, a variety of, of uh, exhibits. And uh, nowadays we have over 3,000 uh, new exhibits since the museum started its, uh, its uh, activity. And we got uh, a lot of exhibits uh, from uh, Białystok Military Museum uh, as a kind of a, a part of exchange. So uh, now we have a huge collection. Let me just get back in a moment to the room over here. As you can see, the room is really small. It's like this one, not bigger. And we can present there only a small part of our uh, collection, okay? So it's three or four percent of the, of the overall amount of exhibits we have. But the final seat of the museum, which I will speak about in a moment, uh, excuse me, will be able to present virtually all of the collection on 2,000 square meters, but this will be uh, described in a moment. So, what I want to say in this part is that we really, really deeply care for every single item, every single document that comes to us, and every um, account, every speech, record, or writing that is given by uh, the deportees or their families. This is a proper place for them to conserve them, to keep them uh, living memory. This is, this is important. As you can see, there are family histories in our collections, uh, pictures of parents and children, uh, pictures of, uh, excuse me, letters and um, written um, memories. So we have a variety of th those documents. This is um, about the activities of museum. And now the last part of uh, my presentation will cover the uh, process of the building of our new final uh, seat. You know now why it will be uh, constructed in Białystok. And now let's have a look on how it will look like. So first of all, the proper location. As you can see over here, it's a bit uh, too uh, light here, but you can see this dark line. It's a railway. And it's not accidental that the uh, warehouse is over here. This is, I think it's a glitch. It should be over here, so excuse me. <laughs> So this railway was leading to the east. And now you can guess what, what, uh, what was it used for. Here we have the Poleska train station. And in this place, Soviets in 1940 and 1941 organized deportations. So uh, the warehouse that will store the museum, it's over here. It's 200 meters from the train station. So this is an important factor. It makes the museum a part of the living history. It's not an accidental place. We choose the place to get easier to people with uh, making them understand why this place is linked with the deportations, okay? So being close to the train station where the deportations were started to the east. Uh, let me remember each one fifth, one of every five Bios, uh, citizens of Białystok were deported. Okay, so the warehouses. It's a larger complex, not only one, we will, um, uh, our museum will be placed in one of them. And the whole group was built in the 30s. Uh, they have a side railway track, so the trains could access them from the side. Uh, and initially, they were constructed for the Polish military in the times of Second Polish Republic, in the 1930s. They were used by the military for um, a storage of, of ammunition, of other military equipment. And when the Soviets attacked Poland in September 1939, along with uh, Nazi Germans as well, of course. Um, first, Białystok was taken by the Germans, then it was uh, given away to the Soviets, and the NKVD and Red Army took the, the warehouses and used them first for uh, storage as well. But it's very possible that uh, when the deportations started, the warehouses were used as an assembly point for the groups of deportees. So this also had uh, a, a meaning for, for the people. As you can see, the state of the building, uh, of all the buildings, is quite poor. One of them is actually already uh, refurbished, but it stores a kind of a cultural center. Uh, and the other one that will be our museum is being refurbished. So 
This is a photo from this spring. Now it's in better condition. In a moment you will see, uh, see it. So as I mentioned, the railway station is several hundred meters from uh, those warehouses, and it's a place where the transports were organized. Here we have an overall view on the, uh, on the building. You can see the new part and the original building made from bricks. This is the warehouse. Of course, we plan to refurbish it. And this is being added right now. Uh, it is, there is a plan to place some uh, railway carriages, of course, not passenger carriages, because as you know, uh, they were not used to transport people. Uh, poles were transported in uh, cargo carriages. So such carriages will be in several places in the exhibition, as well as a train uh, machine engine. Sorry. So the overall concept of the museum seat uh, intends to uh, keep the original uh, warehouse in its proper uh, form and adds a new building uh, for administration purposes. This is uh, a set of photos from the beginning of, uh, excuse me, from late spring this year, also before the works started. And the interiors of the warehouses look like this. They will be cleaned. Some of the walls will be removed for the purpose of installation of the um, main exhibition. The main exhibition will uh, take 2,000 200 square meters, uh, being the biggest exhibition in eastern Poland, east from Wisła River. So it will be a huge, huge museum. As I said, the biggest one uh, east from, from uh, Wisła River. To move on, uh, oh, uh, what's interesting to add, also, as you can see, it's quite dark inside. The lower uh, floor will be dark because it has a certain purpose for the narrative of the exhibition to be dark because we need to build some atmosphere. And the upper part will be um, uh, refurbished with a skylight in the rooftop to, to give some light inside the, inside the rooms. The main exhibition and its design was uh, prepared by a Belgian company, Tempora SA. Uh, they won a kind of a contest in 2014 um, for preparation of the, of the concept of the main uh, exhibition. This is a sneak peek of their uh, design. We also will present a short movie in the end of my presentation uh, about the design of the, of the museum. So uh, this is it, and this is the division of our uh, levels. Uh, to complicate the things, <laughs> we will start over here in the center, not in the upper or lower level. We start here, go in the dark part, which will prepare the people for the experience of deportation. The whole ground level is about the deportation, the horrible experience that uh, struck uh, the Polish citizens. It ends over here, moving upwards to this first floor, as we name it, in the inhuman lands in Siberia and Kazakhstan. And this also gives a glimpse on the 19th and 18th century deportations, and then gets back to the Soviet Union. So the main focus of the exhibition, it's the deportations uh, linked with the Soviet system from before the war, during the war, and what is really important, from after the war. Lots of people do not know then, uh, w that in 1945, when the war ended, it did not end the deportation process. And this topic will also be covered in the last part of our museum, that people will be already feeling that they are exiting the museum, but they will see that there were transports that were going to Siberia backwards, so it will have to make an impression, a really, really strong impression on the visitors that this process was longer than the war itself. And after finishing the exhibition, the visitors will move down to the Katyn Memorial. I think I don't have to explain what it will be about. It will be a place not describing Katyn. The amount of words said about Katyn is, is really big, and we have a Katyn Museum here in Warsaw. We will only uh, give a commemoration of the, for those people and a place that will link this story with Siberian deportations because this link is also very important to understand. The second deportation done in April 1940 was a deportation mainly of families of officers killed in Katyn massacre. So we will also focus on this topic in the, in the presentation in the narrative of the exhibition. So this is the overall plan of our, uh, of our museum with describing of the parts itself. And to move on, 
This is uh, the look of the uh, building in uh, 2017 after the first stage, uh, 2016, excuse me, uh, after the first stage when the basements were constructed of the new building. And you can see how poor looking was the old warehouse. And now it's like this. Those photos were taken in the summer, so we are even higher with the construction over here. And the warehouse is actually being refurbished, cleaned. The bricks are being refurbished. The windows are replaced. Every single thing that needs replacement is already replaced. So we hope that the works will be in schedule. And, and on time, we will finish the building. And nowadays, we are like several days before opening the tender for choosing the company that will build our exhibition itself. So the outer building is under construction, and the interior will be, uh, will be built in the upcoming several years. And that's all for now. I will uh, also uh, finish my presentation with a, a short movie. So one moment, please. This part of our film shows part of the exhibition project. The data given in the movie ending, it's a bit out of date. We actually have more exhibits, over 3,000, as I mentioned. Uh, also more recordings and more written uh, memories. So this data is for 2017, now we have even more. And hopefully this will, this will still grow.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again for your audience. And uh, if there is any contact needed, my email address is uh, below. Uh, I'm English speaking, as you can hear, so you can contact me easily. Uh, I will try to answer all your questions. Uh, thank you again for inviting us uh, over here. And it was a pleasure uh, to have such a speech in front of you. Thank you very much. Piotr Wojciech, thank you, um, all, thank you both very much for coming. Um, I think that you have something. Uh, about our museums. So this is uh, some materials. Now, I think that um, maybe if we can ask Piotr for you to just pass them around. One of the things that we wanted to do um, was um, we've uh, been actually talking to the museum in Białystok, the Polish Army Museum for a few years, which was the parent, if I can say this, the father or the mother of the, uh, mem mem the memory of Sibir Museum, Sibir Memorial Museum. Um, and now that the museum in Białystok has established its own identity, um, it was a great pleasure to discover this, and we decided with, together that we were going to make a formal partnership agreement with Cressus Siberia. So I think we were going to have a very short ceremony to sign this agreement here in front of you and in front of the internet. Um, and this is an agreement for us to start working very closely together around um, preserving the memory, um, the truth, pamięć prawda i przetrwałość preserving the memory and the truth and the survival of these experiences. Um, so I think if I can invite uh, can, Mr. Can, Director here. We can to, see, so we can sign agreement between our presenters. We will uh, officially sign this. I might ask um, Greg if you could take a photograph of us for history as well as we're doing the signing here. It, it, it's not like when President Trump has a big marker. We, we only have, I think, some pens or something. I, did I bring my pen? We have argument, but we don't have... We have, yes. <laughs> so, Yes, can we get um, the picture of MPS at the museum? Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, uh, perfect with the backdrop. And you know, as, as we were seeing yesterday at the dinner, um, it's easy to sign a piece of paper, and we have to sign lots of pieces of paper, but we were saying that for us, we're actually committing that we are going to start working much closer together, and perhaps even our conference. Next year, or in some years, we can have in Białystok, um, that we can get some partnership happening like that as well, and maybe start moving it around and do different things, but that's one of the possibilities. Um, taking more um, uh, partnership and making the interviews available and possible in some of the exhibits uh, that are in the museum, placing them on the internet, and vice versa. I think it's just the beginning. We have uh, a lot of I, a lot I, of possibilities. I, I agree with you because this agreement is only paper, but I think it's only the first step. But I think that the most important is when we really start collaborate between people. So I think that now this is the first step, but the next year on the will be the second first. Maybe we, the next year we meet in Białystok. Yes, and we absolutely see. at the march, the 19th March, because um, it's the 80th anniversary of the beginning of the war, um, the invasion, so we have to mark this. It's the 100th anniversary of Kresy becoming part of 
Poland's Republic uh, in 1919, as Tomasz Kowalkozowski told us. So we want to organize something quite significant, I think, if we can. Well, let's think about that, how we can do that. Um, now, uh, Mr. Director, if I can ask you to just stay here for uh, just a, another minute, and maybe Piotr, if you can come up as well, because, um, because I think we had some time at the end of the day, but you have to go back to Białystok, don't you? Uh, immediately, these guys are going back and forth to Warsaw and Białystok three times this week, so they won't be able to stay for the end of the day questions. So I thought, Maciej, if it was okay, we could maybe take five or seven minutes to just have a bit of a discussion um, around this. Fantastic exhibition, by the way, so I invite you to ask any questions. Popolsko albo po angielsku. Can I just say, uh, Alan first, and uh, Adam, and then Grace, and then Marek, and then Ivana. And Paul, if we have time, I think that's six questions, but let's remember that sequence, okay. And can we pass you a microphone so that um, the translators can hear you upstairs? I know I can hear you, but they need to. I'm, I'm curious, with such a, a major project like this, where does the funding for something like this come from in Poland? Uh, the funding for the project comes from the uh, city council, city of Białystok council, it's a part, and mostly it's financed by, the, by an EU grant. We're talking about the exhibition. The previous stage was also co-financed by uh, the state's money, mostly the city money, and uh, EU gr another EU grant. So this is a kind of a co-funding. Exactly, yes, that's it. Hi, uh, I have a kind of a similar question. Uh, where does the majority of the collections come from? You said that you have things on loan from the, from the military museum. Mm -hmm. I've experienced working at a museum that was founded in 1933, so rules were a little bit more lax about uh, acquiring collections and things like that, so I'm aware of uh, some of the more current challenges for museums, so for such a new museum uh, as this one, how, is it mostly through institutions? Are you relying a lot through private donations? If you could say something about that. It's a, it's a variety of sources, uh, but your question is very interesting, especially covering the topic of the museum exchange. This is not easy, and the answer for this question is, we were uh, starting our activity in January 2017, and we received uh, materials from the Army Museum like several months ago, so you can imagine. It was over a year of preparing the, the uh, exchange, so it was not easy, actually. Uh, it was quite difficult, and it was covered by the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage. So it took over a year to prepare this process. Uh, this was the biggest batch of the documents and materials. Uh, some of them come directly from the families. Uh, it's maybe one-fifth or one-fourth of the materials, uh, which comes from the families, heirlooms uh, s given by the deportees themselves or by their uh, descendants. Uh, this is the second group. And we also participate in auctions and uh, some selling uh, in uh, auction houses. So, so sometimes we can buy something from uh, an open, um, let's say, uh, I don't know the English name, but it's... Open market, yes. Yeah, exactly. That's it. So three, three main groups. Of course, sometimes we also have some um, materials donated by private people, not selling them. Uh, so, so this is this is the main. Uh, these are the main sources of our of our incomes. Okay. Thank example, you. Uh, in this year, uh, I was in Italy. So we have very good relation with the person who live in Italy. So, for example, we have a lot of materials from this part of. Uh, Europe. So we start to have good relation uh, with different uh, group of person from the different countries. It's very important for us, not only from Poland, but uh, in, and in, in, the, in the other uh, countries and the other continents. So. Thank you. Um, now I think I'm just trying to remember when we had the six questions, was it then Grace and then Ivana and then Paul? I haven't missed anybody out of the way and I think there and Marek, so well, I'll ask you to keep questions short and pointy. I, I don't really have a question, but I do have a reaffirmation because uh, we were in Białystok recently, Greg and I, and we visited the uh, uh, facility on Sienkiewicz Street and met with Paniana, and uh, we were blown away, uh, even on that small bit and also on, on and the magnitude of your project. 
Uh, we watched many, many films with her there. Uh, one of the things that really impressed me and I want to share is that how you have involved young people in this project. Uh, in Biawistock, you have the, uh, uh, the bike, uh, uh, like it's, uh, they get all the young people to get on a bike and go out to the cemetery, I think it is, or to the railway tracks with lanterns and place memorials and always having the, the children and the adolescents coming into the museum for these various projects. To me, that was amazing because that's just something that I know that we all want to include uh, the next generation in this. And um, I just wanted to reaffirm that we were there and we were already impressed. So uh, wish you very luck and, and we're so happy that this project is ongoing. Thank you very much. And uh, to add something, uh, the cycling uh, action, it takes place today as well. So it's the next edition. We're, this is why we are going back to Bielostok. Thank you. Now, I think we had Ivana and then Paul. Uh, and I'm Ivana uh, Yanoshaitis. I live um, in England. Yesterday, I shared my song that I've composed, Where Are We Going? And it's in English because I feel it's really important that... Um, the English speaking world should hear our stories. Um, uh, in my song, when hopefully you will hear it, um, I sang it yesterday. There is a verse in Polish which creates that, um, I would like to think, I think you all agree, creates that atmosphere which is uh, terribly important. What I want to say is, I'm, um, I'd like to offer my musical services, I can do a concert. Of, of, I have a large repertoire of Polish um, wartime music, a Polish folk music, Polish patriotic music, and obviously this is very close to my heart, this composition which I specially wrote for Kreset in Siberia, and I'd love people to hear it. And I'd like to engage what that lady said in the, the corner, Grace, um, how important it is to get the young people involved, and I have an experience in working with young people, so I'd like to share my humble services with the museum. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. So the cooperation is starting already. Yes, you already. See? We would love to. OK, Paul. Yes, my father was uh, an exile in, uh, in um, Siberia before 1920. Um, so I'm very excited to hear that uh, there's a potential of finding out about his history. I know where he was, Novo Mikolaevsk, somewhere near the Ural Mountains. Uh, so I'm really, really happy to hear that that's a dimension of your, of your activities. We would be delighted to help in any form. Okay, now, am I losing track of anybody? Well, there's Marek. Tanya wants to jump in. This lady wants to jump in. Uh, if Paulina permits us to steal just a few more minutes of her time. Just a few. And then we'll steal it from Marci. It's actually two questions, but very short, very quick. Uh, one is, um, have you been in touch with Institut Sikorskego in, in London? Yes, mm -hmm. we've been in touch with them. They have a ver large variety of materials, mostly uh, graphics, chronicles of units that were formed in the, uh, from the Anders uh, army. Uh, we know that sources. And in the um, final seat, in our main exhibition, we plan to include some of them. Of course, not everything, because it would be pointless to move the, the materials from there to here. But those most important and most uh, valuable will be presented as well. Chronicles, photos. They have the only collection of photos of uh, the army getting from laggers to the uh, military camps. Those, those soldiers that look more like refugees than, than soldiers. <coughs> well, for, for your information, y yesterday, uh, Jonathan made a film and he actually brought up a film about uh, refugees in East Africa um, and he said that he obtained that from the Institut Chikorskego so, and that's something that you don't need to physically transfer, you know, it can all go via internet. Um, and the second question was, one of you mentioned um, social media, that you already got a presence on social media. Uh, can you say a few words? About uh, yes, uh, we have a Facebook profile. Uh, we have a YouTube channel as well, from the like, most common social media. Uh, we plan to open an Instagram profile, but it's like in the upcoming times. And try to um, use those um, less known, uh, smaller groups of social media activities. Like we, we started to use geocaching, for example, right now in, in the previous month. So uh, we focus on the, those big mass social media, but also try to uh, search for those, those gaps for more like interested people in, in history, in traveling. Okay. 
And what's the Facebook page name? Museum Pamięci Sibiru. Like the name of our museum. Dr. Google can help us find it, in other words. Okay. Do we have time for three more questions? Three more. Proszę Pani. Ja się nazywam Katarzyna Borunia Jagodzińska. Akurat ten temat w ogóle leży mi na sercu. Przepraszam, że nie po angielsku, ale się nie pozbieram z tym. Dla ośrodka karta robiłam też notacje z osobami zesłanymi, no i też w rodzinie mam. Chciałam zapytać o projekt pomnika, bo podobno ma być pomnik również. Czy to jest przez państwa firmowane? Jakie są zasady? i Rozumiem, Wiem, że, że już chyba zostało. Mat matki Sybirackiej, tak? Tak jest, tak. Tak jest. Tak. Z, z naszego środowiska, odpowiem po polsku, z naszego środowiska e, Sybiraków wyszła propozycja, e, żeby zbudować pomnik matek Sybiraczek, bo jest zrozumiała sprawa, że ci Sybiracy, którzy żyją w tej chwili, to są dzieci. monument to the Sybirak, uh, the mother of Sybiraks. And because most of the uh, deportees who are still alive uh, were children, were deported as children, and they remember their mothers giving away their f their own food rations to keep the children al uh, alive. So uh, yes, we are going to erect such a monument to the Sibirak mothers, but uh, for obvious reasons, it cannot be funded from the funds we are, have now for the museum. But the uh, city council is going to organize a public tender for the design of the monument, and we will have a separate uh, separate funding for that. So just so you know, the procedure has, al has already been launched, but uh, as you can imagine, there is a process uh, which takes time. The process has already uh, they begun, uh, the, ten the public tender has already been published, and we are now waiting for offers because we uh, really want the best artists to design this uh, monument. We want this monument to serve uh, future generations. Are you sure? We can take two, really. <laughs> My name is Elena Dysatkova. I'm from Novosibirsk in Siberia. I'm sorry, I'm speaking Polish. I am a researcher of Polish-Siberian uh, history. I have uh, graduated from the Pedagogical University in Novosibirsk. And uh, my focus is on the image of Siberia in Polish historiography uh, and education. And my question is, uh, whether you are planning to present a more positive image of Siberia, uh, for, exa for example, the contribu contribution of the deportees to uh, s the l progress, life and progress in Siberia. Uh, of course, a large part of the museum uh, is dedicated to our trauma related to Siberia, but we must remember you are from Novosibirsk, and uh, about three weeks ago I visited Tomsk, and uh, these two towns are not far from each other in, on Siberian scale, but I visited a um, place, uh, Białystok, Siberian Białystok, so about 200 kilometers from Tomsk, in early 20th century, Poles uh, went, traveled to the United States in search for bread, but they also went to Siberia for the same reason. Uh, in those times, in those days, uh, Siberia was a ty type of America uh, for those people. And when you look at the houses, it's shocking. Um, and of course, uh, historians know that there was a, a dystopian reform uh, where the people got uh, tax relief and special funding uh, that they could only dream of in Warsaw, in Poland. But of course, then the Bolshevik uh, Revolution and uh, the Stalin rule and all this uh, was destroyed and leveled. Uh, those uh, people who came from the Suwalki government uh, that went there 
were not from Białystok, but they called it Białystok because they wanted their town to be to develop as fast as the Białystok they remembered from Poland. Because the Białystok uh, went through a very rapid development at the end of the 19th century. But in 1938, the, during the Great Terror, within one night, imagine that, within one night, all men were arrested. I think over 80 uh, people, out of 80 people, only two returned. The rest were sh executed. Nobody knows where they are until the 1990s when the local river exposed uh, their bones. Uh, there is a film about that. We can guess that uh, they belong to those Poles from Białystok, but they generally are the victims of the Great Terror. Um, but we also want to show this period when the Poles went to Siberia voluntarily and also the 19th century, that even though uh, we were deported in the Tsarist system, many Poles uh, uh, made a great career. I remember, I still remember my visits to Irkutsk and other places uh, where the Siberians, uh, for the Siberians, Poland is not a country because it's too far. But the Poland for them is uh, but specific Poles from the late 19th century who made great discoveries in those areas. They don't think about Poland as a state, it's too far away. But Poland uh, is those specific Poles who live there. And what is interesting, uh, I'm just closing. I know that scholars, uh, academics tend to uh, talk too much, but I have this theor theory that those Poles who were deported after the January uprising, doctors, probably if they had they stayed in Poland, they would have remained regular uh, middle tier citizens. But when they arrived in that um, virgin earth, they immediately became the elite. And it's, uh, it's very clear. And paradoxically, it was their chance also to, pro to advance uh, in life. Um, but uh, we want to also show that because we do not want to compare Zaris reprisals to Stalinist reprisals. Um, the Zarist reprisals were very hard, but you, there was a, a way to um, progress uh, nevertheless. Under Stalin, there was no chance. Ladies and gentlemen, I have this dilemma. In our program, we have we are over time, way over time. So now we are taking time from uh, the next uh, uh, papers. So I do not want to offend anyone, but I have a question. When do you really have to leave? We have to be in Białystok before 6, because we have the um, cycling um, uh, race uh, through the commemoration, uh, through, uh, through memorials. And we will end with a presentation of pre-war mayors of Białystok, because the last mayor of Białystok, Nowakowski, was deported to Siberia, and we don't even know where he died. We have no documents uh, regarding that. The last uh, president who contributed greatly to the development of the city. We want to connect these um, uh, memories of uh, Białystok uh, from the 17th September with the uh, uh, restoration of independence. I'm sorry, Tanya. Uh, but I am sure, um, just in closing, may I just in closing say that um, it's a great honor for you to come. Um, we will be together again tomorrow night. We will be on. Um, on TV, is it Hala Polonia on TV Polonia at 10 p.m. So if you would like to watch this, and then there will be a podcast, I think. So um, if you have any questions you would like me to ask the director and Piotr, I will ask for you, I promise, tomorrow, and I will give you the answers back. But I'm afraid that we do need to now go to um, Paulina and talking about her personal journey to Siberia. And 
Otherwise, you know, we won't finish the day. So thank you again very much. Bardzo dziękuję. Dziękuję bardzo. So um, can I present Paulina Kaszuba? Um, Paulina, are you ready? Do you have your technical everything? Yes, maybe I'll present it just in Polish. Yes, of course, of course. Yes, because they will make a simultaneous translation. Tak, to proszę po polsku. Dobrze. Proszę po polsku tylko. And so I will also just say for Paulina's introduction, please look at the speaker's profiles because it talks a little about her very, her very varied adventures. Um, I feel like I have to wait for the atmosphere to settle a little bit. So just a moment. All right, so możemy zaczynać? Okay. I proszę przedstawić swoją mamę też. Tak, ja was zapraszam. Dzień dobry Państwu. Dzisiaj zaprezentuję moją prezentację na temat mojej wycieczki na Syberię. Zacznę od filmu, fragmenty filmu autorstwa Jacka Frankowskiego z wykształcenia leśnik, zainteresowań historyk, z zawodu karykaturzysta, dokumentalista. Następny, proszę. Tutaj przedstawię krótko moją e, rodzinę, o której będę opowiadać. Anna Jankowska, Aleksander najstarszy, już był po maturze, później ja i Wanda, którą tam się rozchorowała, to przyszedł taki wodzista, zabrał, my weźmiemy ją na leczenie. I w grudniu, proszę pana, przysłali zawiadomienie, że wasza docz umierła 22 grudnia. Przyczyny śmierci nie zapszczają. A jeszcze miałam siostrę Eugenia Jankowska. No i ten najmłodszy brat, Witek, który tam wagon wywrócił. Nazywam się Witold Jankowski. Jestem synem Gajowego Ignacego Jankowskiego z leśnictwa Grobowiec, powiat Bielsk Polacki. Mając 8 lat, z całą rodziną zostaliśmy wywiezieni 10 lutego 40 roku na Syberię. A później, jak przyszła wiosna, to myśmy ożyli. Rwaliśmy szczaw, lebiodę i pokrzywę. I mama to gotowała, odsedzała i robiła z tego jako szpinak. A jeszcze z Polski miała troszkę mąki, tam za, zaprawiła, prawda, i tym się żywili. Doczekaliśmy wiosny, Syberia piękna, dużo w lesie kwiatów. Tam nie trzeba było sadzić kwiatów. Takie wspaniałe kwiaty, że u nas po ogrodach ludzie nie mają tych kwiatów, jakie tam. Proszę pana, stuletnia z kolchozu przyszła kobiecina, a ja byłam akurat w tej zbóżce i ona tej pani wróżyła, bo jej mąż na froncie był. Powiedziała, że twój mąż nie wróci, zginie. A ja mówię do tej sowietki, czy ty mówi wierzysz? On mówi, zaczekaj, zaczekaj, ja zaraz tobie wszystko powiem. Pan wie, sypała z rękała, masz brata, który chce iść, mówi na front, twoje lzy jego nie puszczą. On pójdzie do armii, ale nie do tej. Mówi, ty masz narzeczonego, pilota, ale z nim się nie spotkasz, bo on zginie, mówi, śmiercią pilota. Pan sobie obraża? Ale to było ciekawe, to myśmy, myśmy mieli oddzielny pokój i prycza była i na tej pryczy wszyscy tak spaliśmy. I pewnego razu pokładliśmy się, wie pan, a tu raptem ktoś tak po ścianie jakby worek szyszek rzucił z takim szelestem. A mój tata mówi, Janeczko, bierz ołówek, zapisz, da te godzinę wszystko. Zgadzało się, że to Czarniawski zginął tragiczną śmiercią i dał znać. 
I ja dlatego wierzę w życie pozagrobowe. I tak właśnie babcia jest tu z nami, pamięcią. E, moją wycieczkę na Syberię nazwałam śladami przodków Sy y, Syberia dzisiaj. E, ku pamięci rodziny Jankowskim i wszystkim Sybirakom. A tutaj można sobie wyobrazić, jakie odległości trzeba pokonać, aby tam dotrzeć. 1940 luty, wywóz rodziny, 78 lat potem, 6 rano, 16 lipiec, przybywam do lokalnego hostelu w Irkucku. A Irkuck ma około 600 tysięcy mieszkańców. Jest to jedno z największych miast na Syberii. And it's inhabited by Buryats, but Russians and a Mongolian minority. We see a church, Cerkov in Kazan. Kazan, it was built in 85, finished in 92, and the churchgoers are waiting to enter it. And Irkutsk is famous uh, for wooden architecture. They uh, survived from socialist impact, and uh, the tra traditional architecture is kept. The buildings do not have any foundations, therefore with time they sink in. On the right there is a monument um, commemorating the Red Army. Two central streets is the uh, street of Lenin and Marx, and here is the cent city center, local cars and market, fru f forest food and fruit, and, uh, and cottage cheese made of whey and it was available in Piero. Now, kwas, uh, uh, very typical. Here I, cho I have chosen some dainties, that is kwas cold soup and bureki, so uh, they are like pierogies with meat. Cuisine is similar to gr Georgian cuisine. Buryats live in Irkutsk mainly. Here is a picture of the empty shelves, and I rem I'm reminded when my grandma used to say when she would stand in line the whole day and there was nothing on the shelves, just the pig's ears. Here we visited the local Buddhist temple where I met a monk who gave me some herbs for different ailments. In, uh, just across the street from our hotel there was a sham museum of, sh of shamans and these are accessories, tools for local rituals. On um, uh, July 17, there was a shaman village, and I met an um, Arthur a shaman, and it's the most one of the most impor important. He was telling us what they believe in. They have four main gods and ancestors, and illnesses come from uh, the lack of continuation of the rituals, like from the Old Testament. We stopped uh, giving uh, sacrifices in the, in the offering to gods. That's why it's uh, still con cultivated, in, and these are the bones of uh, uh, lambs. And here we had a special ritual of cleansing men, where the first there was a ritual men were separated and they went into a certain place where were spat, spat upon with alcohol. Uh, 
was spirit and it was a ritual of cleansing and me uh, I was going around those uh, wooden pole, poles and I had to l leave my head and stay in my heart and men joined me and we did some eight circles around on the 18th of January, we visited the island of gods, the most important place in the shamanic culture, and the deep, deepest uh, bike, um, lake in the world, Baikal. And its crystal water is fascinating. Here, I have the local, I am, I'm your local rituals, All each ribbon represents something else. Red means love and white means purity. And you can see beautiful uh, landscape from Baikal. I was mostly surprised by wild horses that were running around our car. This is one of the most important, important uh, places in Ok Olhon. Uh, people come in the morning with rice, with drinks, to feed gods, and they attach the ribbons. Just like I said, each one has a different meaning, and this is some kind of a prayer. I had my yoga in the morning here. The island is 730 square meters, 71 kilometers long, and um, there are steps, and the rest is covered with trees, fir, and um, pine. Fish is mainly supported by fishing. I mean, the island is supported by fishing. There is a new yacht. Here we have some local souvenirs, uh, furs that are hand, hand useful in the in the freezing temperature and local medications. Animal organs are used in their production. Um, July 21st to 23rd, there was um, a little bit of a sample of my grandma's trip on the train. I decided to choose the trans siberian train for 36 hours, and it was an open a uh, car, Ploszadzki, and you could smell Russia, their vodka and kielbasa. Here I see the map that, so you could imagine the vastness of the, and the distance. We went from Itzkurk to Autai. It's three in the morning. It was a Moscow time. And we have, um, uh, we have, um, we switching the car, the trains to Taiga. My grandma came to Taiga. She was deported to Oziorki in Pierwomaisk. And by uh, sleds, they came here to Taiga. That's the end of 36 hour trip. Uh, boys representing who represent the football team in Tomsk. We came, arrived in, in Barno in, uh, at 8 o'clock, and people who were who survived Siberia, this is where they they were coming back to Poland. Barnau is um, about, uh, there is about 700,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, as you see, the socialist architecture domin is dominating here. And the state, Ozorki station in 14 Poles um, uh, arrived there, the ones that 
went to work there to win bread and they were putting the rails there and in 40 my family, family Jankowski got there in 2018, I was walking their footsteps. In Oziorki you see the main railway station and there is a toilet. Not much has happened today. There is no um, plumbing, sewaging. And there is interior of the station. It still looks scary. And the vil local village, local people. I chose a um, part of the movie where my grandma and my aunt, they were talking about spring and they were talking about the beautiful flowers, wildflowers. And the nature is really incredible in this part of the world. Um, on the right, we have the local church, and uh, here in this building, there were barracks for uh, Polish people living in Siberia. Such a small village, and who would imagine how much has happened there? Um, Orthodox Cemetery and the most beautiful part of my trip and that's meeting Ludmiła she writes memoirs about the Siberians and the Polish who were living there one of the older ladies there is still alive and they together are writing down the memoir. This is the contact. If you're interested, you could find out about what was happening with Polish people in this part of Siberia, in Pierwomarsk Ozorki. He, here uh, we are taking a hitchhiker, he's from Tomsk, also a place where there were deportations, Upper Altai. On the 24th of uh, July we are walking with locals, they're giving us a tour. They invited us for supper with Yabol, local fruit, wine, with vodka and, and famous ucha fish soup served in such pots. It's cooked over the fire. And that's a family that we had a chance to meet. We were disappointed with the off-road experience because it was heavy rain. I wanted to see the glacier, but I was all soaked up and I didn't uh, leave the car. And there were almost no views because of the rain and fog. You could not see much. This was the last uh, adventure. And now I'm going to show you a short movie that I took in this, uh, that I made in this trip.
moja babcia vlastne kedyž grá na balalajce i to mňa zrušilo. My grandma used to play balalajka. This really touched me. This was a local, uh, as he has put it, uh, Indian. 